Julius Caesar, Part One of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Julius Caesar, Part 1, Paragraphs 1 to 19. Julius Caesar, the divine, lost his father when he was in the sixteenth year of his age, and the year following, being nominated to the office of high priest of Jupiter, he repudiated Cossutia who was very wealthy, although her family belonged only to the equestrian order, and to whom he had been contracted when he was a mere boy. He then married Cornelia, the daughter of Cinna, who was four times consul, and had by her shortly afterwards a daughter named Julia. Resisting all the efforts of the dictator Scylla to induce him to divorce Cornelia, he suffered the penalty of being stripped of his sacerdotal office, his wife's dowry, and his own patrimonial estates, and, being identified with the adverse faction, was compelled to withdraw from Rome. After changing his place of concealment nearly every night, although he was suffering from a quartan ague, and having effected his release by bribing the officers who had tracked his footsteps, he at length obtained a pardon through the intercession of the Vestal Virgins and of Mamercus Emilius and Aurelius Cotter, his near relatives. We are assured that when Scylla, having withstood for a while the entreaties of his own best friends, persons of distinguished rank, at last yielded to their importunity, he exclaimed, either by a divine impulse or from a shrewd conjecture, your suit is granted, and you may take him among you. But know, he added, that this man, for whose safety you are so extremely anxious, will some day or other be the ruin of the party of the nobles, in defence of which you are leagued with me, for in this one Caesar you will find many a Marius. His first campaign was served in Asia on the staff of the praetor Marcus Thermus, and being dispatched into Bithynia to bring thence a fleet, he loitered so long at the court of Nicomedes as to give occasion to reports of a criminal intercourse between him and that prince, which received additional credit from his hasty return to Bithynia under the pretext of recovering a debt due to a freedman, his client. The rest of his service was more favourable to his reputation, and when Mytilene was taken by storm, he was presented by Thermus with the civic crown. He served also in Cilicia under Servilius Isauricus, but only for a short time, as upon receiving intelligence of Scylla's death he returned with all speed to Rome in expectation of what might follow from a fresh agitation set on foot by Marcus Lepidus. Distrusting, however, the abilities of this leader, and finding the times less favourable for the execution of this project than he had at first imagined, he abandoned all thoughts of joining Lepidus, although he received the most tempting offers. Soon after this civil discord was composed, he preferred a charge of extortion against Cornelius Dolabella, a man of consular dignity who had obtained the honour of a triumph. On the acquittal of the accused, he resolved to retire to Rhodes, with the view not only of avoiding the public odium which he had incurred, but of prosecuting his studies with leisure and tranquillity under Apollonius, the son of Molon, at that time the most celebrated master of rhetoric. While on his voyage thither in the winter season, he was taken by pirates near the island of Pharmacusa, and detained by them, burning with indignation, for nearly forty days, his only attendance being a physician and two chamberlains. For he had instantly dispatched his other servants and the friends who accompanied him to raise money for his ransom. Fifty talents having been paid down, he was landed on the coast, when, having collected some ships, 
he lost no time in putting to sea in pursuit of the pirates, and having captured them, inflicted upon them the punishment with which he had often threatened them in jest. At that time Mithridates was ravaging the neighbouring districts, and on Caesar's arrival at Rhodes, that he might not appear to lie idle while danger threatened the allies of Rome, he passed over into Asia, and having collected some auxiliary forces and driven the king's governor out of the province, retained in their allegiance the cities which were wavering and ready to revolt. Having been elected military tribune, the first honour he received from the suffrages of the people after his return to Rome, he zealously assisted those who took measures for restoring the tribunitian authority, which had been greatly diminished during the usurpation of Scylla. He likewise, by an act, which Plotius, at his suggestion, propounded to the people, obtained the recall of Lucius Cinna, his wife's brother, and others with him, who, having been the adherents of Lepidus in the civil disturbances, had, after that consul's death, fled to Sertorius, which law he supported by a speech. During his quaestorship, he pronounced funeral orations from the rostra, according to custom, in praise of his aunt Julia and his wife Cornelia. In the panegyric on his aunt, he gives the following account of her own and his father's genealogy on both sides. My aunt Julia derived her descent by the mother from a race of kings, and by her father from the immortal gods. For the Marcii Reges, her mother's family, deduced their pedigree from Ancus Martius, and the Julii, her father's, from Venus, of which stock we are a branch. We therefore unite in our descent the sacred majesty of kings, the chiefest among men, and the divine majesty of gods, to whom kings themselves are subject. To supply the place of Cornelia, he married Pompeia, the daughter of Quintus Pompeius, and granddaughter of Lucius Scylla, but he afterwards divorced her upon suspicion of her having been debauched by Publius Clodius, for so current was the report that Clodius had found access to her disguised as a woman during the celebration of a religious solemnity that the Senate instituted an inquiry respecting the profanation of the sacred rites. Father Spain fell to his lot as quaestor, when there, as he was going the circuit of the province by commission from the praetor for the administration of justice, and had reached Gades, seeing a statue of Alexander the Great in the temple of Hercules, he sighed deeply, as if weary of his sluggish life, for having performed no memorable actions at an age at which Alexander had already conquered the world. He therefore immediately sued for his discharge, with the view of embracing the first opportunity which might present itself in the city of entering upon a more exalted career. In the stillness of the night following, he dreamt that he lay with his own mother, but his confusion was relieved, and his hopes were raised to the highest pitch by the interpreters of his dream, who expounded it as an omen that he should possess universal empire, for that the mother who in his sleep he had found submissive to his embraces was no other than the earth, the common parent of all mankind. Quitting therefore the province before the expiration of the usual term, he betook himself to the Latin colonies, which were then eagerly agitating the design of obtaining the freedom of Rome, and he would have stirred them up to some bold attempt, had not the consuls, to prevent any commotion, detained for some time the legions which had been raised for service in Cilicia. But this did not deter him from making, soon afterwards, a still greater effort within the precincts of the city itself. For only a few days before he entered upon the aedileship, he incurred a suspicion of having engaged in a conspiracy with Marcus Crassus, a man of consular rank, to whom were joined Publius Scylla and Lucius Autronius, who, after they had been chosen consuls, 
were convicted of bribery. The plan of the conspirators was to fall upon the Senate at the opening of the new year, and murder as many of them as should be thought necessary, upon which Crassus was to assume the office of dictator, and appoint Caesar his master of the horse. When the commonwealth had been thus ordered according to their pleasure, the consulship was to have been restored to Scylla and Autronius. Mention is made of this plot by Tanusius Geminus in his History, by Marcus Bibulus in his Edicts, and by Curio the Father in his Orations. Cicero likewise seems to hint at this in a letter to Axius, where he says that Caesar had in his consulship secured to himself that arbitrary power to which he had aspired when he was aedile. Tanusius adds that Crassus, from remorse or fear, did not appear upon the day appointed for the massacre of the Senate, for which reason Caesar omitted to give the signal which according to the plan concerted between them he was to have made. The agreement, Curio says, was that he should shake off the toga from his shoulder. We have the authority of the same Curio and of Marcus Actorius Naso for his having been likewise concerned in another conspiracy with young Cnaeus Piso, to whom, upon a suspicion of some mischief being meditated in the city, the province of Spain was decreed out of the regular course. It is said to have been agreed between them that Piso should head a revolt in the provinces, whilst the other should attempt to stir up an insurrection at Rome, using as their instruments the Lambrani and the tribes beyond the Po. But the execution of this design was frustrated in both quarters by the death of Piso. In his aedileship he not only embellished the Comitium and the rest of the Forum with the adjoining halls, but adorned the capital also with temporary piazzas constructed for the purpose of displaying some part of the superabundant collections he had made for the amusement of the people. He entertained them with the hunting of wild beasts and with games, both alone and in conjunction with his colleague. On this account he obtained the whole credit of the expense to which they had jointly contributed, insomuch that his colleague Marcus Bibulus could not forbear remarking that he was served in the manner of Pollux, for as the temple erected in the forum to the two brothers went by the name of Castor alone, so his and Caesar's joint munificence was imputed to the latter only. To the other public spectacles exhibited to the people, Caesar added a fight of gladiators, but with fewer pairs of combatants than he had intended for he had collected from all parts so great a company of them that his enemies became alarmed, and a decree was made restricting the number of gladiators which any one was allowed to retain at Rome. Having thus conciliated popular favour, he endeavoured, through his interest with some of the tribunes, to get Egypt assigned to him as a province by an act of the people. The pretext alleged for the creation of this extraordinary government was that the Alexandrians had violently expelled their king, whom the Senate had complimented with the title of an ally and friend of the Roman people. This was generally resented, but notwithstanding there was so much opposition from the faction of the nobles that he could not carry his point. In order, therefore, to diminish their influence by every means in his power, he restored the trophies erected in honour of Gaius Marius on account of his victories over Jugurtha, the Cimbri, and the Teutoni, which had been demolished by Scylla. And when sitting in judgment upon murderers, he treated those as assassins who, in the late prescription, had received money from the treasury for bringing in the heads of Roman citizens, although they were expressly accepted in the Cornelian laws. He likewise suborned someone to prefer an impeachment for treason against Gaius Riberius, by whose especial assistance the Senate had, a few years before, put down Lucius Saturninus the seditious tribune, and being drawn by law to judge on the trial, 
he condemned him with so much animosity that upon his appealing to the people no circumstance availed him so much as the extraordinary bitterness of his judge having renounced all hope of obtaining egypt for his province he stood candidate for the office of chief pontiff to secure which he had recourse to the most profuse bribery calculating on this occasion the enormous amount of the debts he had contracted he is reported to have said to his mother when she kissed him at his going out in the morning to the assembly of the people i will never return home unless i am elected pontiff in effect he left so far behind him two most powerful competitors who were much his superiors both in age and rank that he had more votes in their own tribes than they both had in all the tribes together after he was chosen praetor the conspiracy of catiline was discovered and while every other member of the senate voted for inflicting capital punishment on the accomplices in that crime he alone proposed that the delinquents should be distributed for safe custody among the towns of italy their property being confiscated he even struck such terror into those who were advocates for greater severity by representing to them what universal odium would be attached to their memories by the roman people that decius silanus consul elect did not hesitate to qualify his proposal it not being very honourable to change it by a lenient interpretation as if it had been understood in a harsher sense than he intended and caesar would certainly have carried his point having brought over to his side a great number of the senators among whom was cicero the consul's brother had not a speech by marcus cato infused new vigour into the resolutions of the senate he persisted however in obstructing the measure until a body of the roman knights who stood under arms as a guard threatened him with instant death if he continued his determined opposition they even thrust at him with their drawn swords so that those who sat next him moved away and a few friends with no small difficulty protected him by throwing their arms round him and covering him with their togas at last deterred by this violence he not only gave way but absented himself from the senate house during the remainder of that year upon the first day of his praetorship he summoned quintus catulus to render an account to the people respecting the repairs of the capital proposing a decree for transferring the office of curator to another person but being unable to withstand the strong opposition made by the aristocratical party whom he perceived quitting in great numbers their attendance upon the new consuls and fully resolved to resist his proposal he dropped the design he afterwards approved himself a most resolute supporter of cecilius metallus tribune of the people who in spite of all opposition from his colleagues had proposed some laws of a violent tendency until they were both dismissed from office by a vote of the senate he ventured notwithstanding to retain his post and continue in the administration of justice but finding that preparations were made to obstruct him by force of arms he dismissed the lictors threw off his gown and betook himself privately to his own house with the resolution of being quiet in a time so unfavourable to his interests he likewise pacified the mob which two days afterwards flocked about him and in a riotous manner made a voluntary tender of their assistance in the vindication of his honour this happening contrary to expectation the senate who met in haste on account of the tumult gave him their thanks by some of the leading members of the house and sending for him after high commendation of his conduct cancelled their former vote and restored him to his office but he soon got into fresh trouble being named amongst the accomplices of catiline both before novius niger the quaestor by lucius vetius the informer and in the senate by quintus curius to whom a reward had been voted for having first discovered the designs of the conspirators.
Curious affirmed that he had received his information from Catiline. Vetius even engaged to produce in evidence against him his own handwriting given to Catiline. Caesar, feeling that this treatment was not to be borne, appealed to Cicero himself whether he had not voluntarily made a discovery to him of some particulars of the conspiracy, and so balked Curious of his expected reward. He therefore obliged Vetius to give pledges for his behaviour, seized his goods, and after heavily fining him, and seeing him almost torn in pieces before the rostra, threw him into prison, to which he likewise sent Novius the Quister, for having presumed to take an information against a magistrate of superior authority. At the expiration of his praetorship, he obtained by lot the father Spain, and pacified his creditors, who were for detaining him, by finding sureties for his debts. Contrary, however, to both law and custom, he took his departure before the usual equipage and outfit were prepared. It is uncertain whether this precipitancy arose from the apprehension of an impeachment, with which he was threatened on the expiration of his former office, or from his anxiety to lose no time in relieving the allies, who implored him to come to their aid. He had no sooner established tranquillity in the province than, without waiting for the arrival of his successor, he returned to Rome with equal haste to sue for a triumph and the consulship. The day of election, however, being already fixed by proclamation, he could not legally be admitted a candidate unless he entered the city as a private person. On this emergency he solicited a suspension of the laws in his favour, but such an indulgence being strongly opposed, he found himself under the necessity of abandoning all thoughts of a triumph, lest he should be disappointed of the consulship. Of the two other competitors for the consulship, Lucius Lucius and Marcus Bibulus, he joined with the former, upon condition that Lucius, being a man of less interest but greater affluence, should promise money to the electors in their joint names, upon which the party of the nobles, dreading how far he might carry matters in that high office with a colleague disposed to concur in and second his measures, advised Bibulus to promise the voters as much as the other, and most of them contributed towards the expense Cato himself admitting that bribery under such circumstances was for the public good. He was accordingly elected consul jointly with Bibulus. Actuated still by the same motives, the prevailing party took care to assign provinces of small importance to the new consuls, such as the care of the woods and roads. Caesar, incensed at this indignity, endeavoured by the most assiduous and flattering attentions to gain to his side Cnaeus Pompey, at that time dissatisfied with the Senate for the backwardness they showed to confirm his acts after his victories over Mithridates. He likewise brought about a reconciliation between Pompey and Marcus Crassus, who had been at variance from the time of their joint consulship in which office they were continually clashing and he entered into an agreement with both that nothing should be transacted in the government which was displeasing to any of the three. End of Julius Caesar, Part 1 Recording by Graham Redman Julius Caesar, Part Two of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Julius Caesar, Part Two, Paragraphs Twenty to Thirty Three. 
Having entered upon his office, he introduced a new regulation that the daily acts both of the Senate and people should be committed to writing and published. He also revived an old custom that an officer should precede him and his lictors follow him on the alternate months when the fasces were not carried before him. Upon preferring a bill to the people for the division of some public lands, he was opposed by his colleague, whom he violently drove out of the forum. Next day the insulted consul made a complaint in the Senate of this treatment, but such was the consternation that no one having the courage to bring the matter forward or move a censure, which had been often done under outrages of less importance, he was so much dispirited that until the expiration of his office he never stirred from home and did nothing but issue edicts to obstruct his colleagues' proceedings. From that time, therefore, Caesar had the sole management of public affairs, insomuch that some wags, when they signed any instrument as witnesses, did not add, in the consulship of Caesar and Bibulus, but of Julius and Caesar, putting the same person down twice under his name and surname. The following verses, likewise, were currently repeated on this occasion. Known bibulo quid quam nuper, sed caesare factum est, nam bibulo fieri consule nil memini. Nothing was done in Bibulus's year, no, Caesar only then was consul here. The land of Stellas, consecrated by our ancestors to the gods, with some other lands in Campania left subject to tribute for the support of the expenses of the government, he divided, but not by lot, among upwards of twenty thousand freemen, who had each of them three or more children. He eased the publicans, upon their petition, of a third part of the sum which they had engaged to pay into the public treasury, and openly admonished them not to bid so extravagantly upon the next occasion. He made various profuse grants to meet the wishes of others, no one opposing him, or if any such attempt was made, it was soon suppressed. Marcus Cato, who interrupted him in his proceedings, he ordered to be dragged out of the Senate House by a lictor and carried to prison. Lucius Lucullus, likewise, for opposing him with some warmth, he so terrified with the apprehension of being criminated, that, to deprecate the consul's resentment, he fell on his knees. And upon Cicero's lamenting in some trial the miserable condition of the times, he the very same day, by nine o'clock, transferred his enemy, Publius Clodius, from a patrician to a plebeian family, a change which he had long solicited in vain. At last, effectually to intimidate all those of the opposite party, he by great rewards prevailed upon Vetchus to declare that he had been solicited by certain persons to assassinate Pompey, and when he was brought before the rostra to name those who had been concerted between them, after naming one or two to no purpose, not without great suspicion of subornation, Caesar, despairing of success in this rash stratagem, is supposed to have taken off his informer by poison. About the same time he married Calpurnia, the daughter of Lucius Piso, who was to succeed him in the consulship, and gave his own daughter Julia to Cnaeus Pompey, rejecting Servilius Scipio, to whom she had been contracted, and by whose means chiefly he had but a little before baffled Bibulus. After this new alliance, he began, upon any debates in the Senate, to ask Pompey's opinion first, whereas he used before to give that distinction to Marcus Crassus, and it was the usual practice for the consul to observe throughout the year the method of consulting the Senate which he had adopted on the calends, the first, of January. Being therefore now supported by the interest of his father-in-law and son-in-law, of all the provinces he made choice of Gaul as most likely to furnish him with matter and occasion for triumphs. At first, indeed, he received only Cisalpine Gaul, 
with the addition of Illyricum, by a decree proposed by Vatinius to the people, but soon afterwards obtained from the senate Gallia Cometa also, the senators being apprehensive that if they should refuse it him, that province also would be granted him by the people. Elated now with his success, he could not refrain from boasting a few days afterwards in a full senate house that he had, in spite of his enemies and to their great mortification, obtained all he desired, and that for the future he would make them, to their shame, submissive to his pleasure. One of the senators observing sarcastically, "'That will not be very easy for a woman to do,' He jocosely replied, Semiramis formerly reigned in Assyria, and the Amazons possessed great part of Asia. When the term of his consulship had expired, upon a motion being made in the Senate by Gaius Memmius and Lucius Domitius, the praetors, respecting the transactions of the year past, he offered to refer himself to the house but they, declining the business, after three days spent in vain altercation, he set out for his province. Immediately, however, his quaestor was charged with several misdemeanours for the purpose of implicating Caesar himself. Indeed, an accusation was soon after preferred against him by Lucius Antistius, tribune of the people. But by making an appeal to the tribune's colleagues, he succeeded in having the prosecution suspended during his absence in the service of the state. To secure himself, therefore, for the time to come, he was particularly careful to secure the goodwill of the magistrates at the annual elections, assisting none of the candidates with his interest, nor suffering any persons to be advanced to any office who would not positively undertake to defend him in his absence, for which purpose he made no scruple to require of some of them an oath and even a written obligation. But when Lucius Domitius became a candidate for the consulship, and openly threatened that, upon his being elected consul, he would effect that which he could not accomplish when he was praetor, and divest him of the command of the armies, he sent for Crassus and Pompey to Lucca, a city in his province, and pressed them for the purpose of disappointing Domitius to sue again for the consulship, and to continue him in his command for five years longer, with both which requisitions they complied. Presumptuous now from his success, he added at his own private charge more legions to those which he had received from the Republic among the former of which was one levied in Transalpine Gaul, and called by a Gallic name a lauder, which he trained and armed in the Roman fashion, and afterwards conferred on it the freedom of the city. From this period he declined no occasion of war, however unjust and dangerous, attacking without any provocation as well the allies of Rome as the barbarous nations which were its enemies, insomuch that the Senate passed a decree for sending commissioners to examine into the condition of Gaul, and some members even proposed that he should be delivered up to the enemy. But so great had been the success of his enterprises that he had the honour of obtaining more days of supplication, and those more frequently, than had ever before been decreed to any commander. During nine years in which he held the government of the province, his achievements were as follows. He reduced all Gaul, bounded by the Pyrenean forest, the Alps, Mount Gibena, and the two rivers, the Rhine and the Rhone, and being about 3,200 miles in compass, into the form of a province, excepting only the nations in alliance with the Republic, and such as had merited his favour, imposing upon this new acquisition an annual tribute of forty millions of sesterces. He was the first of the Romans who, crossing the Rhine by a bridge, 
attacked the Germanic tribes inhabiting the country beyond that river, whom he defeated in several engagements. He also invaded the Britons, a people formerly unknown, and, having vanquished them, exacted from them contributions and hostages. Amidst such a series of successes, he experienced thrice only any signal disaster. Once in Britain, when his fleet was nearly wrecked in a storm, in Gaul at Jagovia, where one of his legions was put to the rout, and in the territory of the Germans, his lieutenants, Titurius and Aranculius, were cut off by an ambuscade. During this period he lost his mother, whose death was followed by that of his daughter, and, not long afterwards, of his granddaughter. Meanwhile, the Republic being in consternation at the murder of Publius Clodius, and the Senate passing a vote that only one consul, namely Gnaeus Pompeius, should be chosen for the ensuing year, he prevailed with the tribunes of the people, who intended joining him in nomination with Pompey, to propose to the people a bill enabling him, though absent, to become a candidate for his second consulship, when the term of his command should be near expiring, that he might not be obliged on that account to quit his province too soon, and before the conclusion of the war. Having attained this object, carrying his views still higher, and animated with the hopes of success, he omitted no opportunity of gaining universal favour by acts of liberality and kindness to individuals, both in public and private. With money raised from the spoils of the war, he began to construct a new forum, the ground plot of which cost him above a hundred millions of sesterces. He promised the people a public entertainment of gladiators, and a feast in memory of his daughter, such as no one before him had ever given. The more to raise their expectations on this occasion, although he had agreed with victuallers of all denominations for his feast, he made yet farther preparations in private houses. He issued an order that the most celebrated gladiators, if at any time during the combat they incurred the displeasure of the public, should be immediately carried off by force and reserved for some future occasion. Young gladiators he trained up, not in the school and by the masters of defence, but in the houses of Roman knights and even senators skilled in the use of arms, earnestly requesting them, as appears from his letters, to undertake the discipline of those novitiates, and to give them the word during their exercises. He doubled the pay of the legions in perpetuity, allowing them likewise corn when it was in plenty, without any restriction, and sometimes distributing to every soldier in his army a slave and a portion of land. To maintain his alliance and good understanding with Pompey, he offered him in marriage his sister's granddaughter Octavia, who had been married to Gaius Marcellus, and requested for himself his daughter, lately contracted to Forster Scylla. Every person about him, and a great part likewise of the Senate, he secured by loans of money at low interest, or none at all, and to all others who came to wait upon him, either by invitation or of their own accord, he made liberal presents, not neglecting even the freedmen and slaves who were favourites with their masters and patrons. He offered also singular and ready aid to all who were under prosecution or in debt, and to prodigal youths, excluding from his bounty those only who were so deeply plunged in guilt, poverty, or luxury, that it was impossible effectually to relieve them. These, he openly declared, could derive no benefit from any other means than a civil war. He endeavoured with equal assiduity to engage in his interest princes and provinces in every part of the world, 
presenting some with thousands of captives, and sending to others the assistance of troops at whatever time and place they desired, without any authority from either the senate or people of Rome. He likewise embellished with magnificent public buildings the most powerful cities not only of Italy, Gaul, and Spain, but of Greece and Asia, until all people, being now astonished and speculating on the obvious tendency of these proceedings, Claudius Marcellus, the consul, declaring first by proclamation that he intended to propose a measure of the utmost importance to the state, made a motion in the senate that some person should be appointed to succeed Caesar in his province before the term of his command was expired, because the war was being brought to a conclusion, peace was restored, and the victorious army ought to be disbanded. He further moved that Caesar being absent, his claims to be a candidate at the next election of consuls should not be admitted, as Pompey himself had afterwards abrogated that privilege by a decree of the people. The fact was that Pompey, in his law relating to the choice of chief magistrates, had forgot to accept Caesar in the article in which he declared all such as were not present incapable of being candidates for any office. But soon afterwards, when the law was inscribed on brass and deposited in the treasury, he corrected his mistake. Marcellus, not content with depriving Caesar of his provinces and the privilege intended him by Pompey, likewise moved the Senate that the freedom of the city should be taken from those colonists whom, by the Vatinian law, he had settled at New Como, because it had been conferred upon them with ambitious views and by a stretch of the laws. Roused by these proceedings, and thinking, as he was often heard to say, that it would be a more difficult enterprise to reduce him, now that he was the chief man in the state, from the first rank of citizens to the second, than from the second to the lowest of all, Caesar made a vigorous opposition to the measure, partly by means of the tribunes who interposed in his behalf, and partly through Servius Sulpicius, the other consul. The following year, likewise, when Gaius Marcellus, who succeeded his cousin Marcus in the consulship, pursued the same course, Caesar, by means of an immense bribe, engaged in his defence Emilius Paulus, the other consul, and Gaius Curio, the most violent of the tribunes. But finding the opposition obstinately bent against him, and that the consuls elect were also of that party, he wrote a letter to the senate, requesting that they would not deprive him of the privilege kindly granted him by the people, or else that the other generals should resign the command of their armies as well as himself. Fully persuaded, as it is thought, that he could more easily collect his veteran soldiers whenever he pleased, than Pompey could his new-raised troops. At the same time he made his adversaries an offer to disband eight of his legions, and give up Transalpine Gaul, upon condition that he might retain two legions with the Cisalpine province, or but one legion with Illyricum, until he should be elected consul. But as the Senate declined to interpose in the business, and his enemies declared that they would enter into no compromise where the safety of the Republic was at stake, he advanced into hither Gaul, and, having gone the circuit for the administration of justice, made a halt at Ravenna, resolved to have recourse to arms if the Senate should proceed to extremity against the tribunes of the people who had espoused his cause. This was indeed his pretext for the civil war, but it is supposed that there were other motives for his conduct. Cnaeus Pompey used frequently to say that he sought to throw everything into confusion because he was unable, with all his private wealth, to complete the works he had begun, 
and answer at his return the vast expectations which he had excited in the people. Others pretend that he was apprehensive of being called to account for what he had done in his first consulship, contrary to the auspices, laws, and the protests of the tribunes, Marcus Cato having sometimes declared, and that too with an oath, that he would prefer an impeachment against him as soon as he disbanded his army. A report likewise prevailed that if he returned as a private person, he would, like Milo, have to plead his cause before the judges surrounded by armed men. This conjecture is rendered highly probable by Asinius Pollio, who informs us that Caesar, upon viewing the vanquished and slaughtered enemy in the field of Pharsalia, expressed himself in these very words. This was their intention. I, Gaius Caesar, after all the great achievements I had performed, must have been condemned had I not summoned the army to my aid. Some think that, having contracted from long habit an extraordinary love of power, and having weighed his own and his enemy's strength, he embraced that occasion of usurping the supreme power, which indeed he had coveted from the time of his youth. This seems to have been the opinion entertained by Cicero, who tells us in the third book of his offices that Caesar used to have frequently in his mouth two verses of Euripides, which he thus translates. Nam si violandum est jus, regnam di gratia violandum est, aliis rebus pietatem collas. Be just unless a kingdom tempts to break the laws, for sovereign power alone can justify the cause. When intelligence, therefore, was received that the interposition of the tribunes in his favour had been utterly rejected, and that they themselves had fled from the city, he immediately sent forward some cohorts, but privately, to prevent any suspicion of his design, and, to keep up appearances, attended at a public spectacle, examined the model of a fencing school which he proposed to build, and, as usual, sat down to table with a numerous party of his friends. But after sunset, mules being put to his carriage from a neighbouring mill, he set forward on his journey with all possible privacy and a small retinue. The lights going out, he lost his way, and wandered about a long time, until at length, by the help of a guide, whom he found towards daybreak, he proceeded on foot through some narrow paths, and again reached the road. Coming up with his troops on the banks of the Rubicon, which was the boundary of his province, he halted for a while, and, revolving in his mind the importance of the step he was on the point of taking, he turned to those about him and said, We may still retreat, but if we pass this little bridge, nothing is left for us but to fight it out in arms. While he was thus hesitating, the following incident occurred. A person remarkable for his noble mien and graceful aspect appeared close at hand, sitting and playing upon a pipe when not only the shepherds but a number of soldiers also flocked from their posts to listen to him, and some trumpeters among them, he snatched a trumpet from one of them, ran to the river with it, and sounding the advance with a piercing blast, crossed to the other side. Upon this Caesar exclaimed, Let us go whither the omens of the gods and the iniquity of our enemies call us. The die is now cast. Accordingly, having marched his army over the river, he showed them the tribunes of the people, who, upon their being driven from the city, had come to meet him, and in the presence of that assembly called upon the troops to pledge him their fidelity, with tears in his eyes, and his garment rent from his bosom. 
it has been supposed that upon this occasion he promised to every soldier a knight's estate, but that opinion is founded on a mistake, for when in his harangue to them he frequently held out a finger of his left hand, and declared that to recompense those who should support him in the defence of his honour, he would willingly part even with his ring, the soldiers at a distance, who could more easily see than hear him while he spoke, formed their conception of what he said by the eye, not by the ear, and accordingly gave out that he had promised to each of them the privilege of wearing the gold ring and an estate of four hundred thousand sesterces. End of Julius Caesar, Part 2 Recording by Graham Redman Julius Caesar, Part 3 of The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Julius Caesar, Part 3, Paragraphs 34 to 55. Of his subsequent proceedings, I shall give a cursory detail in the order in which they occurred. He took possession of Picenum, Umbria, and Etruria and having obliged Lucius Domitius, who had been tumultuously nominated his successor, and held Corsinium with a garrison, to surrender, and dismissed him, he marched along the coast of the upper sea to Brundisium, to which place the consuls and Pompey were fled with the intention of crossing the sea as soon as possible. After vain attempts by all the obstacles he could oppose to prevent their leaving harbour, he turned his steps towards Rome, where he appealed to the Senate on the present state of public affairs, and then set out for Spain, in which province Pompey had a numerous army, under the command of three lieutenants, Marcus Petrius, Lucius Afranius, and Marcus Varro, declaring amongst his friends before he set forward that he was going against an army without a general, and should return thence against a general without an army. Though his progress was retarded both by the siege of Marseilles, which shut her gates against him, and a very great scarcity of corn, yet in a short time he bore down all before him. Thence he returned to Rome, and crossing the sea to Macedonia, blocked up Pompey during almost four months, within a line of ramparts of prodigious extent, and at last defeated him in the battle of Pharsalia. Pursuing him in his flight to Alexandria, where he was informed of his murder, he presently found himself also engaged, under all the disadvantages of time and place, in a very dangerous war with King Ptolemy, who, he saw, had treacherous designs upon his life. It was winter, and he, within the walls of a well-provided and subtle enemy, was destitute of everything and wholly unprepared for such a conflict. He succeeded, however, in his enterprise, and put the kingdom of Egypt into the hands of Cleopatra and her younger brother, being afraid to make it a province, lest under an aspiring prefect it might become the centre of revolt. From Alexandria he went into Syria, and thence to Pontus, induced by intelligence which he had received respecting Pharnaces. This prince, who was son of the great Mithridates, had seized the opportunity which the distraction at the times offered for making war upon his neighbours, and his insolence and fierceness had grown with his success. Caesar, however, 
within five days after entering his country and four hours after coming in sight of him overthrew him in one decisive battle upon which he frequently remarked to those about him the good fortune of pompey who had obtained his military reputation chiefly by victory over so feeble an enemy he afterwards defeated scipio and juba who were rallying the remains of the party in africa and pompey's sons in spain during the whole course of the civil war he never once suffered any defeat except in the case of his lieutenants of whom gaius curio fell in africa gaius antonius was made prisoner in illyricum publius dolabella lost a fleet in the same illyricum and Cnaeus Domitius Calvinus an army in Pontus. In every encounter with the enemy where he himself commanded, he came off with complete success. Nor was the issue ever doubtful except on two occasions, once at Dyrrachium, when, being obliged to give ground, and Pompey not pursuing his advantage, he said that Pompey knew not how to conquer. The other instance occurred in his last battle in Spain, when, despairing of the event, he even had thoughts of killing himself. For the victories obtained in the several wars, he triumphed five different times. After the defeat of Scipio, four times in one month, each triumph succeeding the former by an interval of a few days and once again after the conquest of Pompey's sons. His first and most glorious triumph was for the victories he gained in Gaul, the next for that of Alexandria, the third for the reduction of Pontus, the fourth for his African victory, and the last for that in Spain, and they all differed from each other in their varied pomp and pageantry. On the day of the Gallic triumph, as he was proceeding along the street called Velebrum, after narrowly escaping a fall from his chariot by the breaking of the axle-tree, he ascended the capital by torchlight, forty elephants carrying torches on his right and left. Amongst the pageantry of the Pontic triumph, a tablet with this inscription was carried before him, I came, I saw, I conquered, not signifying as other mottoes on the like occasion what was done, so much as the dispatch with which it was done. To every foot soldier in his veteran legions, besides the two thousand sesterces paid him in the beginning of the civil war, he gave twenty thousand more in the shape of prize money. He likewise allotted them lands, but not in contiguity, that the former owners might not be entirely dispossessed. To the people of Rome, besides ten modii of corn and as many pounds of oil, he gave three hundred sesterces a man, which he had formerly promised them, and a hundred more to each for the delay in fulfilling his engagement. He likewise remitted a year's rent due to the treasury, for such houses in Rome as did not pay above two thousand sesterces a year, and through the rest of Italy, for all such as did not exceed in yearly rent five hundred sesterces. To all this he added a public entertainment and a distribution of meat, and after his Spanish victory two public dinners for considering the first he had given as too sparing and unsuited to his profuse liberality he five days afterwards added another which was most plentiful the spectacles he exhibited to the people were of various kinds namely a combat of gladiators and stage plays in the several wards of the city and in different languages Likewise, Circensian games, wrestlers, and the representation of a sea fight. In the conflict of gladiators presented in the forum, Furius Leptinus, a man of Praetorian family, entered the lists as a combatant, 
as did also Quintus Calpinus, formerly a senator and a pleader of causes. The Pyrrhic dance was performed by some youths who were sons to persons of the first distinction in Asia and Bithynia. In the plays, Decimus Laberius, who had been a Roman knight, acted in his own piece, and being presented on the spot with five hundred thousand sesterces and a gold ring, he went from the stage through the orchestra and resumed his place in the seats allotted for the equestrian order. In the Circensian games, the circus being enlarged at each end and a canal sunk round it, several of the young nobility drove chariots drawn some by four and others by two horses, and likewise rode races on single horses. The Trojan game was acted by two distinct companies of boys, one differing from the other in age and rank. The hunting of wild beasts was presented for five days successively, and on the last day a battle was fought by five hundred foot, twenty elephants, and thirty horse on each side. To afford room for this engagement, the goals were removed, and in their space two camps were pitched, directly opposite to each other. Wrestlers likewise performed for three days successively in a stadium provided for the purpose in the Campus Martius. A lake having been dug in the little Codita, ships of the Tyrian and Egyptian fleets, containing two, three, and four banks of oars, with a number of men on board, afforded an animated representation of a sea-fight. To these various diversions there flocked such crowds of spectators from all parts, that most of the strangers were obliged to lodge in tents erected in the streets or along the roads near the city. Several in the throng were squeezed to death, amongst whom were two senators. Turning afterwards his attention to the regulation of the commonwealth, he corrected the calendar, which had for some time become extremely confused through the unwarrantable liberty which the pontiffs had taken in the article of intercalation. To such a height had this abuse proceeded, that neither the festivals designed for the harvest fell in summer, nor those for the vintage in autumn. He accommodated the year to the course of the sun, ordaining that in future it should consist of three hundred and sixty-five days without any intercalary month, and that every fourth year an intercalary day should be inserted. That the year might thenceforth commence regularly with the calends, or first of January, he inserted two months between November and December, so that the year in which this regulation was made consisted of fifteen months, including the month of intercalation, which, according to the division of time then in use, happened that year. He filled up the vacancies in the Senate by advancing several plebeians to the rank of patricians, and also increased the numbers of praetors, aediles, quaestors, and inferior magistrates, restoring at the same time such as had been degraded by the censors or convicted of bribery at elections. The choice of magistrates he so divided with the people that, excepting only the candidates for the consulship, they nominated one half of them and he the other. The method which he practised in those cases was to recommend such persons as he had pitched upon by bills dispersed through the several tribes, to this effect. Caesar the dictator, to such a tribe, naming it, I recommend to you, naming likewise the persons, that by the favour of your votes they may attain to the honours for which they sue. He likewise admitted to offices the sons of those who had been proscribed. The trial of causes he restricted to two orders of judges, the equestrian and senatorial, 
excluding the tribunes of the treasury who had before made a third class. The revised census of the people he ordered to be taken neither in the usual manner or place, but street by street by the principal inhabitants of the several quarters of the city, and he reduced the number of those who received corn at the public cost from three hundred and twenty to a hundred and fifty thousand. To prevent any tumults on account of the census, he ordered that the praetor should every year fill up by lot the vacancies occasioned by death from those who were not enrolled for the receipt of corn. Eighty thousand citizens having been distributed into foreign colonies, he enacted, in order to stop the drain on the population, that no free man of the city above twenty and under forty years of age, who was not in the military service, should absent himself from Italy for more than three years at a time, that no senator's son should go abroad unless in the retinue of some high officer, and as to those whose pursuit was tending flocks and herds, that no less than a third of the number of their shepherds freeborn should be youths. He likewise made all those who practised physic in Rome, and all teachers of the liberal arts, free of the city, in order to fix them in it, and induce others to settle there. With respect to debts, he disappointed the expectation which was generally entertained that they would be totally cancelled, and ordered that the debtors should satisfy their creditors according to the valuation of their estates at the rate at which they were purchased before the commencement of the civil war, deducting from the debt what had been paid for interest either in money or by bonds by virtue of which provision about a fourth part of the debt was lost. He dissolved all the guilds, except such as were of ancient foundation. Crimes were punished with greater severity, and the rich being more easily induced to commit them because they were only liable to banishment without the forfeiture of their property, he stripped murderers, as Cicero observes, of their whole estates, and other offenders of one half. He was extremely assiduous and strict in the administration of justice. He expelled from the Senate such members as were convicted of bribery, and he dissolved the marriage of a man of Praetorian rank, who had married a lady two days after her divorce from a former husband, although there was no suspicion that they had been guilty of any illicit connection. He imposed duties on the importation of foreign goods. The use of litters for travelling, purple robes, and jewels, he permitted only to persons of a certain age and station and on particular days. He enforced a rigid execution of the sumptuary laws, placing officers about the markets to seize upon all meats exposed to sale contrary to the rules and bring them to him, sometimes sending his lictors and soldiers to carry away such victuals as had escaped the notice of the officers, even when they were upon the table. His thoughts were now fully employed from day to day on a variety of great projects for the embellishment and improvement of the city, as well as for guarding and extending the bounds of the empire. In the first place, he meditated the construction of a temple to Mars, which should exceed in grandeur everything of that kind in the world. For this purpose, he intended to fill up the lake on which he had entertained the people with the spectacle of a sea-fight. He also projected a most spacious theatre adjacent to the Tarpeian Mount, and also proposed to reduce the civil law to a reasonable compass, and out of that immense and undigested mass of statutes to extract the best and most necessary parts into a few books to make as large a collection as possible of works in the Greek and Latin languages for the public use, 
the province of providing and putting them in proper order being assigned to Marcus Varro. He intended likewise to drain the Pomptine marshes, to cut a channel for the discharge of the waters of the Lake Fusinus, to form a road from the upper sea through the ridge of the Apennine to the Tiber, to make a cut through the Isthmus of Corinth, to reduce the Dacians, who had overrun Pontus and Thrace, within their proper limits, and then to make war upon the Parthians through the lesser Armenia, but not to risk a general engagement with them until he had made some trial of their prowess in war. But in the midst of all his undertakings and projects, he was carried off by death. Before I speak of which, it may not be improper to give an account of his person, dress, and manners, together with what relates to his pursuits, both civil and military. It is said that he was tall, of a fair complexion, round-limbed, rather full-faced, with eyes black and piercing, and that he enjoyed excellent health, except towards the close of his life, when he was subject to sudden fainting fits and disturbance in his sleep. He was likewise twice seized with the falling sickness while engaged in active service. He was so nice in the care of his person that he not only kept the hair of his head closely cut and had his face smoothly shaved, but even caused the hair on other parts of the body to be plucked out by the roots, a practice for which some persons rallied him. His baldness gave him much uneasiness, having often found himself upon that account exposed to the jibes of his enemies. He therefore used to bring forward the hair from the crown of his head, and of all the honours conferred upon him by the senate and people, there was none which he either accepted or used with greater pleasure than the right of wearing constantly a laurel crown. It is said that he was particular in his dress, for he used the latest clavus with fringes about the wrists, and always had it girded about him, but rather loosely. This circumstance gave origin to the expression of Scylla, who often advised the nobles to beware of the ill-girt boy. He first inhabited a small house in the Sabara, but after his advancement to the pontificate, he occupied a palace belonging to the state in the Via Sacra. Many writers say that he liked his residence to be elegant and his entertainments sumptuous, and that he entirely took down a villa near the grove of Aricia, which he had built from the foundation and finished at a vast expense, because it did not exactly suit his taste, although he had at that time but slender means and was in debt, and that he carried about in his expeditions tessellated and marble slabs for the floor of his tent. They likewise report that he invaded Britain in hopes of finding pearls, the size of which he would compare together and ascertain the weight by poising them in his hand, that he would purchase at any cost gems, carved works, statues, and pictures executed by the eminent masters of antiquity, and that he would give for young and handy slaves a price so extravagant that he forbade its being entered in the diary of his expenses. We are also told that in the provinces he constantly maintained two tables, one for the officers of the army and the gentry of the country, and the other for Romans of the highest rank and provincials of the first distinction. He was so very exact in the management of his domestic affairs, both little and great, that he once threw a baker into prison for serving him with a finer sort of bread than his guests, and put to death a freedman who was a particular favourite for debauching the lady of a Roman knight, although no complaint had been made to him of the affair. The only stain upon his chastity was his having cohabited with Nicomedes, 
and that indeed stuck to him all the days of his life, and exposed him to much bitter raillery. I will not dwell upon those well-known verses of Calvus Licinius, Whate'er Bithynia and her lord possessed, Her lord who Caesar in his lust caressed. I pass over the speeches of Dolabella and Curio the father, in which the former calls him the queen's rival and the inner side of the royal couch, and the latter the brothel of Nicomedes and the Bithynian stew. I would likewise say nothing of the edicts of Bibulus, in which he proclaimed his colleague under the name of the Queen of Bithynia, adding that he had formerly been in love with a king, but now coveted a kingdom. At which time, as Marcus Brutus relates, one Octavius, a man of a crazy brain, and therefore the more free in his raillery, after he had in a crowded assembly saluted Pompey by the title of king, addressed Caesar by that of queen. Gaius Memmius likewise upbraided him with serving the king at table among the rest of his catamites, in the presence of a large company in which were some merchants from Rome, the names of whom he mentions. But Cicero was not content with writing in some of his letters that he was conducted by the royal attendants into the king's bedchamber, lay upon a bed of gold with a covering of purple, and that the youthful bloom of this scion of Venus had been tainted in Bithynia. But upon Caesar's pleading the cause of Nysa, the daughter of Nicomedes, before the senate, and recounting the king's kindnesses to him, replied, Pray tell us no more of that, for it is well known what he gave you, and you gave him. To conclude, his soldiers in the Gallic triumph, amongst other verses, such as they jocularly sung on those occasions following the general's chariot, recited these, which since that time have become extremely common. The Gauls to Caesar yield, Caesar to Nicomede. Lo, Caesar triumphs for his glorious deed, but Caesar's conqueror gains no victor's meed. It is admitted by all that he was much addicted to women, as well as very expensive in his intrigues with them, and that he debauched many ladies of the highest quality, among whom were Posthumia, the wife of Servius Sulpicius, Lollia, the wife of Aulus Gabinius, Tertulla, the wife of Marcus Crassus, and Mucia, the wife of Cnaeus Pompey. For it is certain that the Curios, both father and son, and many others, made it a reproach to Pompey that to gratify his ambition he married the daughter of a man upon whose account he had divorced his wife after having had three children by her, and whom he used, with a deep sigh, to call Aegisthus. But the mistress he most loved was Servilia, the mother of Marcus Brutus, for whom he purchased in his first consulship after the commencement of their intrigue a pearl which cost him six millions of sesterces, and in the civil war, besides other presents, assigned to her for a trifling consideration some valuable farms when they were exposed to public auction. Many persons expressing their surprise at the lowness of the price, Cicero wittily remarked, To let you know the real value of the purchase, between ourselves, Tertia was deducted. For Servilia was supposed to have prostituted her daughter Tertia to Caesar. That he had intrigues likewise with married women in the provinces appears from this distich, which was as much repeated in the Gallic triumph as the former. Watch well your wives, ye sits, we bring a blade, a bald pate master of the wenching trade. Thy gold was spent on many a Gallic whore, 
exhausted now thou comest to borrow more in the number of his mistresses were also some queens such as Eunoe, a moor the wife of bogudes to whom and her husband he made as naso reports many large presents but his greatest favourite was cleopatra with whom he often revelled all night until the dawn of day and would have gone with her through egypt in dalliance as far as ethiopia in her luxurious yacht had not the army refused to follow him he afterwards invited her to rome whence he sent her back loaded with honours and presents and gave her permission to call by his name a son who according to the testimony of some greek historians resembled caesar both in person and gait mark antony declared in the senate that caesar had acknowledged the child as his own and that gaius matius gaius oppius and the rest of caesar's friends knew it to be true on which occasion oppius as if it had been an imputation which he was called upon to refute published a book to show that the child which cleopatra fathered upon caesar was not his helvius sinner tribune of the people admitted to several persons the fact that he had a bill ready drawn which caesar had ordered him to get enacted in his absence allowing him with the hope of leaving issue to take any wife he chose and as many of them as he pleased and to leave no room for doubt of his infamous character for unnatural lewdness and adultery curio the father says in one of his speeches he was every woman's man and every man's woman it is acknowledged even by his enemies that in regard to wine he was abstemious a remark is ascribed to marcus cato that caesar was the only sober man amongst all those who were engaged in the design to subvert the government in the matter of diet caius oppius informs us that he was so indifferent that when a person in whose house he was entertained had served him with stale instead of fresh oil and the rest of the company would not touch it he alone ate very heartily of it that he might not seem to tax the master of the house with rusticity or want of attention but his abstinence did not extend to pecuniary advantages either in his military commands or civil offices for we have the testimony of some writers that he took money from the proconsul who was his predecessor in spain and from the roman allies in that quarter for the discharge of his debts and plundered at the point of the sword some towns of the lusitanians notwithstanding they attempted no resistance and opened their gates to him upon his arrival before them in gaul he rifled the chapels and temples of the gods which were filled with rich offerings and demolished cities oftener for the sake of their spoil than for any ill they had done by this means gold became so plentiful with him that he exchanged it through italy and the provinces of the empire for three thousand sesterces the pound in his first consulship he purloined from the capital three thousand pounds weight of gold and substituted for it the same quantity of gilt brass he bartered likewise to foreign nations and princes for gold the titles of allies and kings and squeezed out of ptolemy alone near six thousand talents in the name of himself and pompey he afterwards supported the expense of the civil wars and of his triumphs and public spectacles by the most flagrant rapine and sacrilege in eloquence and warlike achievements he equalled at least if he did not surpass the greatest of men after his prosecution of dolabella he was indisputably reckoned one of the most distinguished advocates cicero in recounting to brutus the famous orators declares 
that he does not see that Caesar was inferior to any one of them, and says that he had an elegant, splendid, noble, and magnificent vein of eloquence, and in a letter to Cornelius Nepos, he writes of him in the following terms. What, of all the orators who, during the whole course of their lives, have done nothing else, which can you prefer to him? Which of them is more pointed or terse in his periods, or employs more polished and elegant language? In his youth he seems to have chosen Strabo Caesar for his model, from whose oration in behalf of the Sardinians he has transcribed some passages literally into his divination. In his delivery he is said to have had a shrill voice, and his action was animated, but not ungraceful. He has left behind him some speeches, among which are ranked a few that are not genuine, such as that on behalf of Quintus Metellus. These Augustus supposes, with reason, to be rather the production of blundering shorthand writers who were not able to keep pace with him in the delivery, than publications of his own. For I find in some copies that the title is not For Metellus, but What He Wrote to Metellus, whereas the speech is delivered in the name of Caesar, vindicating Metellus and himself from the aspersions cast upon them by their common defamers. The speech addressed to his soldiers in Spain, Augustus considers likewise as spurious. We meet with two under this title, one made as is pretended in the first battle, and the other in the last at which time Asinius Pollio says he had not leisure to address the soldiers on account of the suddenness of the enemy's attack. End of Julius Caesar, Part 3 Recording by Graham Redman Julius Caesar, Part Four of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Julius Caesar, Part 4, Paragraphs 56 to 79. He has likewise left commentaries of his own actions both in the war in Gaul and in the civil war with Pompey. For the author of the Alexandrian, African, and Spanish wars is not known with any certainty. Some think they are the production of Oppius, and some of Hirtius, the latter of whom composed the last book, which is imperfect, of the Gallic War. Of Caesar's commentaries, Cicero in his Brutus speaks thus. He wrote his commentaries in a manner deserving of great approbation. They are plain, precise, and elegant, without any affectation of rhetorical ornament. In having thus prepared materials for others who might be inclined to write his history, he may perhaps have encouraged some silly creatures to enter upon such a work, who will needs be dressing up his actions in all the extravagance of bombast. But he has discouraged wise men from ever attempting the subject. Hirtius delivers his opinion of these commentaries in the following terms. So great is the approbation with which they are universally perused, that, instead of rousing, he seems to have precluded the efforts of any future historian. Yet, with respect to this work, we have more reason to admire him than others, for they only know how well and correctly he has written, but we know likewise how easily and quickly he did it. 
Pollio Asinius thinks that they were not drawn up with much care or with a due regard to truth, for he insinuates that Caesar was too hasty of belief in regard to what was performed by others under his orders, and that he has not given a very faithful account of his own acts either by design or through defect of memory, expressing at the same time an opinion that Caesar intended a new and more correct edition. He has left behind him likewise two books on analogy, with the same number under the title of Anti Cato, and a poem entitled The Itinerary. Of these books he composed the first two in his passage over the Alps as he was returning to the army after making his circuit in hither Gaul, the second work about the time of the Battle of Munda, and the last during the four and twenty days he employed in his journey from Rome to farther Spain. There are extant some letters of his to the Senate, written in a manner never practised by any before him, for they are distinguished into pages in the form of a memorandum book, whereas the consuls and commanders till then used constantly in their letters to continue the line quite across the sheet without any folding or distinction of pages. There are extant likewise some letters from him to Cicero and others to his friends concerning his domestic affairs in which, if there was occasion for secrecy, he wrote in ciphers, that is, he used the alphabet in such a manner that not a single word could be made out. The way to decipher those epistles was to substitute the fourth for the first letter, as D for A, and so for the other letters, respectively. Some things likewise pass under his name, said to have been written by him when a boy or a very young man as the encomium of Hercules, a tragedy entitled Oedipus, and a collection of apothems, all of which Augustus forbade to be published in a short and plain letter to Pompeius Mesa, who was employed by him in the arrangement of his libraries. He was perfect in the use of arms, an accomplished rider, and able to endure fatigue beyond all belief. On a march he used to go at the head of his troops, sometimes on horseback, but oftener on foot, with his head bare in all kinds of weather. He would travel post in a light carriage without baggage at the rate of a hundred miles a day, and if he was stopped by floods in the rivers, he swam across or floated on skins inflated with wind, so that he often anticipated intelligence of his movements. In his expeditions it is difficult to say whether his caution or his daring was most conspicuous. He never marched his army by roads which were exposed to ambuscades without having previously examined the nature of the ground by his scouts, nor did he cross over to Britain before he had carefully examined in person the navigation, the harbours, and the most convenient point of landing in the island. When intelligence was brought to him of the siege of his camp in Germany, he made his way to his troops through the enemy's stations in a Gaulish dress. He crossed the sea from Brundisium and Dyrrachium in the winter through the midst of the enemy's fleets, and the troops, under orders to join him, being slow in their movements, notwithstanding repeated messages to hurry them, but to no purpose, he at last went privately and alone aboard a small vessel in the night-time, with his head muffled up. Nor did he make himself known, or suffer the master to put about, although the wind blew strong against them, until they were ready to sink. He was never deterred from any enterprise, nor retarded in the prosecution of it by superstition. When a victim which he was about to offer in sacrifice made its escape, he did not therefore defer his expedition against Scipio and Juba, and happening to fall upon stepping out of the ship, he gave a lucky turn to the omen by exclaiming, I hold thee fast, Africa! 
to chide the prophecies which were spread abroad that the name of the Scipios was by the decrees of fate fortunate and invincible in that province, he retained in the camp a profligate wretch of the family of the Cornelii, who, on account of his scandalous life, was surnamed Saluito. He not only fought pitched battles, but made sudden attacks when an opportunity offered, often at the end of a march, and sometimes during the most violent storms, when nobody could imagine he would stir. Nor was he ever backward in fighting until towards the end of his life. He then was of opinion that the oftener he had been crowned with success, the less he ought to expose himself to new hazards, and that nothing he could gain by a victory would compensate for what he might lose by a miscarriage. He never defeated the enemy without driving them from their camp and giving them no time to rally their forces. When the issue of a battle was doubtful, he sent away all the horses, and his own first, that having no means of flight, they might be under the greater necessity of standing their ground. He rode a very remarkable horse, with feet almost like those of a man, the hoofs being divided in such a manner as to have some resemblance to toes. This horse he had bred himself, and the soothsayers having interpreted these circumstances into an omen that its owner would be master of the world, he brought him up with particular care, and broke him in himself, as the horse would suffer no one else to mount him. A statue of this horse was afterwards erected by Caesar's order before the temple of Venus Genitrix. He often rallied his troops when they were giving way by his personal efforts, stopping those who fled, keeping others in their ranks, and seizing them by their throat turned them towards the enemy. Although numbers were so terrified that an eagle-bearer thus stopped, made a thrust at him with the spear-head, and another, upon a similar occasion, left the standard in his hand. The following instances of his resolution are equally and even more remarkable. After the Battle of Pharsalia, having sent his troops before him into Asia, as he was passing the straits of the Hellespont in a ferry-boat, he met with Lucius Cassius, one of the opposite party, with ten ships of war, and so far from endeavouring to escape, he went alongside his ship, and calling upon him to surrender, Cassius humbly gave him his submission. At Alexandria, in the attack of a bridge, being forced by a sudden sally of the enemy into a boat, and several others hurrying in with him, he leapt into the sea, and saved himself by swimming to the next ship, which lay at the distance of two hundred paces. Holding up his left hand out of the water, for fear of wetting some papers which he held in it, and pulling his general's cloak after him with his teeth, lest it should fall into the hands of the enemy. He never valued a soldier for his moral conduct or his means, but for his courage only, and treated his troops with a mixture of severity and indulgence, for he did not always keep a strict hand over them, but only when the enemy was near. Then, indeed, he was so strict a disciplinarian that he would give no notice of a march or a battle until the moment of action, in order that the troops might hold themselves in readiness for any sudden movement, and he would frequently draw them out of the camp without any necessity for it, especially in rainy weather and upon holy days. Sometimes giving them orders not to lose sight of him, he would suddenly depart by day or by night, and lengthen the marches in order to tire them out, as they followed him at a distance. When at any time his troops were dispirited by reports of the great force of the enemy, he rallied their courage, not by denying the truth of what was said, or by diminishing the facts, but on the contrary, 
by exaggerating every particular. Accordingly, when his troops were in great alarm at the expected arrival of King Juba, he called them together and said, I have to inform you that in a very few days the king will be here, with ten legions, thirty thousand horse, a hundred thousand light-armed foot, and three hundred elephants. Let none of you therefore presume to make further inquiry or indulge in conjectures, but take my word for what I tell you, which I have from undoubted intelligence. Otherwise I shall put them aboard an old crazy vessel, and leave them exposed to the mercy of the winds, to be transported to some other country. He neither noticed all their transgressions, nor punished them according to strict rule. But for deserters and mutineers he made the most diligent inquiry, and their punishment was most severe. Other delinquencies he would connive at. Sometimes, after a great battle ending in victory, he would grant them a relaxation from all kinds of duty, and leave them to revel at pleasure, being used to boast that his soldiers fought nothing the worse for being well oiled. In his speeches he never addressed them by the title of soldiers, but by the kinder phrase of fellow-soldiers and kept them in such splendid order that their arms were ornamented with silver and gold, not merely for parade, but to render the soldiers more resolute to save them in battle, and fearful of losing them. He loved his troops to such a degree that when he heard of the defeat of those under Titurius, he neither cut his hair nor shaved his beard until he had revenged it upon the enemy by which means he engaged their devoted affection, and raised their valour to the highest pitch. Upon his entering on the civil war, the centurions of every legion offered, each of them, to maintain a horseman at his own expense, and the whole army agreed to serve gratis without either corn or pay, those amongst them who were rich, charging themselves with the maintenance of the poor. No one of them during the whole course of the war deserted to the enemy, and many of those who were made prisoners, though they were offered their lives upon condition of bearing arms against him, refused to accept the terms. They endured want and other hardships, not only when they were besieged themselves, but when they besieged others, to such a degree that Pompey, when blocked up in the neighbourhood of Dyrrachium, upon seeing a sort of bread made of an herb, which they lived upon, said, I have to do with wild beasts, and ordered it immediately to be taken away, because if his troops should see it, their spirit might be broken by perceiving the endurance and determined resolution of the enemy. With what bravery they fought, one instance affords sufficient proof, which is that after an unsuccessful engagement at Dyrrachium, they called for punishment, insomuch that their general found it more necessary to comfort than to punish them. In other battles, in different quarters, they defeated with ease immense armies of the enemy, although they were much inferior to them in number. In short, one cohort of the Sixth Legion held out a fort against four legions belonging to Pompey during several hours, being almost every one of them wounded by the vast number of arrows discharged against them, and of which there were found within the ramparts a hundred and thirty thousand. This is no way surprising when we consider the conduct of some individuals amongst them, such as that of Cassius Siva, a centurion, or Gaius Acilius, a common soldier, not to speak of others. Siva, after having an eye struck out, being run through the thigh and the shoulder, and having his shield pierced in an hundred and twenty places, maintained obstinately the guard of the gate of a fort, with the command of which he was entrusted. Acilius, in the sea-fight at Marseilles, 
having seized a ship of the enemies with his right hand and that being cut off in imitation of that memorable instance of resolution in Sinegyrus amongst the Greeks, boarded the enemy's ship, bearing down all before him with the boss of his shield. They never once mutinied during all the ten years of the Gallic War, but were sometimes refractory in the course of the Civil War. However, they always returned quickly to their duty, and that not through the indulgence, but in submission to the authority of their general. For he never yielded to them when they were insubordinate, but constantly resisted their demands. He disbanded the whole Ninth Legion with ignominy at Placentia, although Pompey was still in arms, and would not receive them again into his service until they had not only made repeated and humble entreaties, but until the ringleaders in the mutiny were punished. When the soldiers of the Tenth Legion at Rome demanded their discharge and rewards for their service, with violent threats and no small danger to the city, although the war was then raging in Africa, he did not hesitate, contrary to the advice of his friends, to meet the Legion and disband it but addressing them by the title of Quirites instead of soldiers, he by this single word so thoroughly brought them round and changed their determination that they immediately cried out they were his soldiers, and followed him to Africa, although he had refused their service. He nevertheless punished the most mutinous among them with the loss of a third of their share in the plunder and the land destined for them. In the service of his clients, while yet a young man, he evinced great zeal and fidelity. He defended the cause of a noble youth, Masintha, against King Hiemsal, so strenuously that in a scuffle which took place upon the occasion he seized by the beard the son of King Juba, and upon Masintha's being declared tributary to Hiemsal, while the friends of the adverse party were violently carrying him off, he immediately rescued him by force, kept him concealed in his house a long time, and when, at the expiration of his praetorship, he went to Spain, he took him away in his litter, in the midst of his lictors bearing the fasces, and others who had come to attend and take leave of him. He always treated his friends with such kindness and good nature, that when Gaius Oppius, in travelling with him through a forest, was suddenly taken ill, he resigned to him the only place there was to shelter them at night, and lay upon the ground in the open air. When he had placed himself at the head of affairs, he advanced some of his faithful adherents, though of mean extraction, to the highest offices. And when he was censured for this partiality, he openly said, Had I been assisted by robbers and cutthroats in the defence of my honour, I should have made them the same recompense. The resentment he entertained against any one was never so implacable that he did not very willingly renounce it when opportunity offered. Although Gaius Memmius had published some extremely virulent speeches against him, and he had answered him with equal acrimony, yet he afterwards assisted him with his vote and interest when he stood candidate for the consulship. When Gaius Calvus, after publishing some scandalous epigrams upon him, endeavoured to effect a reconciliation by the intercession of friends, he wrote to him of his own accord the first letter. And when Valerius Catullus, who had, as he himself observed, fixed such a stain upon his character in his verses upon Mamara as never could be obliterated, begged his pardon, he invited him to supper the same day, and continued to take up his lodging with his father occasionally, as he had been accustomed to do. His temper was also naturally averse to severity in retaliation. 
after he had captured the pirates by whom he had been taken, having sworn that he would crucify them, he did so, indeed, but he first ordered their throats to be cut. He could never bear the thought of doing any harm to Cornelius Fagitas, who had dogged him in the night when he was sick and a fugitive, with the design of carrying him to Scylla, and from whose hands he had escaped with some difficulty by giving him a bribe. Philemon, his amanuensis, who had promised his enemies to poison him, he put to death without torture. When he was summoned as a witness against Publius Clodius, his wife Pompeia's gallant, who was prosecuted for the profanation of religious ceremonies, he declared he knew nothing of the affair, although his mother Aurelia and his sister Julia gave the court an exact and full account of the circumstances. And being asked why then he had divorced his wife, because, he said, my family should not only be free from guilt, but even from the suspicion of it. Both in his administration and his conduct towards the vanquished party in the civil war, he showed a wonderful moderation and clemency. For while Pompey declared that he would consider those as enemies who did not take arms in defence of the Republic, he desired it to be understood that he should regard those who remained neuter as his friends. With regard to all those to whom he had, on Pompey's recommendation, given any command in the army, he left them at perfect liberty to go over to him if they pleased. When some proposals were made at Illyria for a surrender, which gave rise to a free communication between the two camps, and Aphranius and Petrius, upon a sudden change of resolution, had put to the sword all Caesar's men who were found in the camp, he scorned to imitate the base treachery which they had practised against himself. On the field of Pharsalia he called out to the soldiers to spare their fellow-citizens, and afterwards gave permission to every man in his army to save an enemy. None of them, so far as appears, lost their lives but in battle, excepting only Aphranius, Faustus, and young Lucius Caesar, and it is thought that even they were put to death without his consent. Aphranius and Faustus had borne arms against him after obtaining their pardon, and Lucius Caesar had not only in the most cruel manner destroyed with fire and sword his freedmen and slaves, but cut to pieces the wild beasts which he had prepared for the entertainment of the people. And finally, a little before his death, he permitted all whom he had not before pardoned to return into Italy and to bear offices both civil and military. He even replaced the statues of Scylla and Pompey, which had been thrown down by the populace. And after this, whatever was devised or uttered, he chose rather to check than to punish it. Accordingly, having detected certain conspiracies and nocturnal assemblies, he went no farther than to intimate by a proclamation that he knew of them and as to those who indulged themselves in the liberty of reflecting severely upon him, he only warned them in a public speech not to persist in their offence. He bore with great moderation a virulent libel written against him by Aulus Cicinna, and the abusive lampoons of Pithalaeus most highly reflecting on his reputation. His other words and actions, however, so far outweigh all his good qualities that it is thought he abused his power and was justly cut off. For he not only obtained excessive honours, such as the consulship every year, the dictatorship for life and the censorship, but also the title of emperor and the surname of father of his country, besides having his statue amongst the kings, and a lofty couch in the theatre. He even suffered some honours to be decreed to him which were unbefitting the most exalted of mankind, 
such as a gilded chair of state in the senate house and on his tribunal a consecrated chariot and banners in the circensian procession temples altars statues among the gods a bed of state in the temples a priest and a college of priests dedicated to himself like those of pan and that one of the months should be called by his name there were indeed no honours which he did not either assume himself or grant to others at his will and pleasure in his third and fourth consulship he used only the title of the office being content with the power of dictator which was conferred upon him with the consulship and in both years he substituted other consuls in his room during the three last months so that in the intervals he held no assemblies of the people for the election of magistrates excepting only tribunes and aediles of the people and appointed officers under the name of prefects instead of the praetors to administer the affairs of the city during his absence the office of consul having become vacant by the sudden death of one of the consuls the day before the calends of january the first of january he conferred it on a person who requested it of him for a few hours assuming the same license and regardless of the customs of his country he appointed magistrates to hold their offices for terms of years he granted the insignia of the consular dignity to ten persons of praetorian rank he admitted into the senate some men who had been made free of the city and even natives of gaul who were semi-barbarians he likewise appointed to the management of the mint and the public revenue of the state some servants of his own household and entrusted the command of three legions which he left at alexandria to an old catamite of his the son of his freedman rufinus he was guilty of the same extravagance in the language he publicly used as titus ampius informs us according to whom he said the republic is nothing but a name without substance or reality scylla was an ignorant fellow to abdicate the dictatorship men ought to consider what is becoming when they talk with me and look upon what i say as a law to such a pitch of arrogance did he proceed that when a soothsayer announced to him the unfavourable omen that the entrails of a victim offered for sacrifice were without a heart he said the entrails will be more favourable when i please and it ought not to be regarded as a prodigy that a beast should be found wanting a heart but what brought upon him the greatest odium and was thought an unpardonable insult was his receiving the whole body of the conscript fathers sitting before the temple of venus genetrix when they waited upon him with a number of decrees conferring on him the highest dignities some say that on his attempting to rise he was held down by cornelius balbus others that he did not attempt to rise at all but frowned on gaius trebatius who suggested to him that he should stand up to receive the senate this behaviour appeared the more intolerable in him because when one of the tribunes of the people pontius aquila would not rise up to him as he passed by the tribune's seat during his triumph he was so much offended that he cried out well then you tribune aquila oust me from the government and for some days afterwards he never promised a favour to any person without this proviso if pontus aquila will give me leave to this extraordinary mark of contempt for the senate he added another affront still more outrageous for when after the sacred rites of the latin festival he was returning home amidst the immoderate and unusual acclamations of the people a man in the crowd put a laurel crown encircled with a white fillet on one of his statues upon which the tribunes of the people epidius morallus and cisetius flavus 
ordered the fillet to be removed from the crown and the man to be taken to prison. Caesar, being much concerned either that the idea of royalty had been suggested to so little purpose, or, as was said, that he was thus deprived of the merit of refusing it, reprimanded the tribunes very severely and dismissed them from their office. From that day forward he was never able to wipe off the scandal of affecting the name of king, although he replied to the populace when they saluted him by that title, I am Caesar, and no king. And at the feast of the Lupercalia, when the consul Antony placed a crown upon his head in the rostra several times, he as often put it away, and sent it to the capital for Jupiter the best and the greatest. A report was very current that he had a design of withdrawing to Alexandria or Ilium, whither he proposed to transfer the imperial power, to drain Italy by new levies, and to leave the government of the city to be administered by his friends. To this report it was added that in the next meeting of the Senate, Lucius Cotter, one of the fifteen, would make a motion that as there was in the Sibylline books a prophecy that the Parthians would never be subdued but by a king, Caesar should have that title conferred upon him. End of Julius Caesar, Part 4 Recording by Graham Redman Julius Caesar, Part Five of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Julius Caesar, Part Five, Paragraphs eighty to eighty nine. For this reason, the conspirators precipitated the execution of their design that they might not be obliged to give their assent to the proposal. Instead, therefore, of caballing any longer separately in small parties, they now united their councils, the people themselves being dissatisfied with the present state of affairs, both privately and publicly condemning the tyranny under which they lived, and calling on patriots to assert their cause against the usurper. Upon the admission of foreigners into the Senate, a handbill was posted up in these words, A good deed! let no one show a new senator the way to the house. These verses were likewise currently repeated. The Gauls he dragged in triumph through the town, Caesar has brought into the senate house, and changed their plaids for the patrician gown. Gallus Caesar in triumphum ducit, e idem in curiam, Galli bracas deposuerunt, latum clavum sumserunt. When Quintus Maximus, who had been his deputy in the consulship for the last three months, entered the theatre, and the lictor, according to custom, bid the people take notice who was coming, they all cried out, He is no consul. After the removal of Cisicius and Morullus from their office, they were found to have a great many votes at the next election of consuls. Some one wrote under the statue of Lucius Brutus, Would you were now alive! And under the statue of Caesar himself, these lines. Because he drove from Rome the royal race, Brutus was first made consul in their place. This man, because he put the consuls down, has been rewarded with a royal crown. Brutus, quia reges ejecit, 
consul primus factus est hic quia consules eiecit rex postremo factus est about sixty persons were engaged in the conspiracy against him of whom gaius cassius and marcus and decimus brutus were the chief it was at first debated amongst them whether they should attack him in the campus martius when he was taking the votes of the tribes and some of them should throw him off the bridge whilst others should be ready to stab him upon his fall or else in the via sacra or at the entrance of the theatre but after public notice had been given by proclamation for the senate to assemble upon the ides of march the fifteenth of march in the senate house built by pompey they approved both of the time and place as most fitting for their purpose caesar had warning given him of his fate by indubitable omens a few months before when the colonists settled at capua by virtue of the julian law were demolishing some old sepulchres in building country houses and were the more eager at the work because they discovered certain vessels of antique workmanship a tablet of brass was found in a tomb in which capis the founder of capua was said to have been buried with an inscription in the greek language to this effect whenever the bones of capis come to be discovered a descendant of iulus will be slain by the hands of his kinsmen and his death revenged by fearful disasters throughout italy lest any person should regard this anecdote as a fabulous or silly invention it was circulated upon the authority of gaius balbus an intimate friend of caesar's a few days likewise before his death he was informed that the horses which upon his crossing the rubicon he had consecrated and turned loose to graze without a keeper abstained entirely from eating and shed floods of tears the soothsayer spurinna observing certain ominous appearances in a sacrifice which he was offering advised him to beware of some danger which threatened to befall him before the ides of march were passed the day before the ides birds of various kinds from a neighbouring grove pursuing a wren which flew into pompey's senate house with a sprig of laurel in its beak tore it in pieces also in the night on which the day of his murder dawned he dreamt at one time that he was soaring above the clouds and at another that he had joined hands with jupiter his wife calpurnia fancied in her sleep that the pediment of the house was falling down and her husband stabbed on her bosom immediately upon which the chamber doors flew open on account of these omens as well as his infirm health he was in some doubt whether he should not remain at home and defer to some other opportunity the business which he intended to propose to the senate but decimus brutus advising him not to disappoint the senators who were numerously assembled and waited his coming he was prevailed upon to go and accordingly set forward about the fifth hour in his way some person having thrust into his hand a paper warning him against the plot he mixed it with some other documents which he held in his left hand intending to read it at leisure victim after victim was slain without any favourable appearances in the entrails but still disregarding all omens he entered the senate house laughing at spurinna as a false prophet because the ides of march were come without any mischief having befallen him to which the soothsayer replied they are come indeed but not past when he had taken his seat the conspirators stood round him under colour of paying their compliments and immediately tullius simba who had engaged to commence the assault advancing nearer than the rest as if he had some favour to request caesar made signs that he should defer his petition to some other time 
Tullius immediately seized him by the toga on both shoulders, at which Caesar, crying out, Violence is meant, one of the Cassii wounded him a little below the throat. Caesar seized him by the arm and ran it through with his styli, and, endeavouring to rush forward, was stopped by another wound. Finding himself now attacked on all hands with naked poniards, he wrapped the toga about his head, and at the same moment drew the skirt round his legs with his left hand, that he might fall more decently with the lower part of his body covered. He was stabbed with three and twenty wounds, uttering a groan only, but no cry, at the first wound, although some authors relate that when Marcus Brutus fell upon him, he exclaimed, What? Art thou too one of them? Thou my son! The whole assembly instantly dispersing, he lay for some time after he expired, until three of his slaves laid the body on a litter and carried it home, with one arm hanging down over the side. Among so many wounds there was none that was mortal, in the opinion of the surgeon Antistius, except the second, which he received in the breast. The conspirators meant to drag his body into the Tiber as soon as they had killed him, to confiscate his estate, and rescind all his enactments. But they were deterred by fear of Mark Antony and Lepidus, Caesar's master of the horse, and abandoned their intentions. At the instance of Lucius Piso, his father-in-law, his will was opened and read in Mark Antony's house. He had made it on the Ides, the 13th, of the preceding September, at his Lavican villa, and committed it to the custody of the chief of the Vestal Virgins. Quintus Tubero informs us that in all the wills he had signed, from the time of his first consulship to the breaking out of the civil war, Cnaeus Pompey was appointed his heir, and that this had been publicly notified to the army. But in his last will he named three heirs, the grandsons of his sisters, namely Gaius Octavius for three-fourths of his estate, and Lucius Pinarius and Quintus Pedius for the remaining fourth. Other heirs in remainder were named at the close of the will, in which he also adopted Gaius Octavius, who was to assume his name, into his family, and nominated most of those who were concerned in his death among the guardians of his son if he should have any, as well as Decimus Brutus amongst his heirs of the second order. He bequeathed to the Roman people his gardens near the Tiber, and three hundred sesterces each man. Notice of his funeral having been solemnly proclaimed, a pile was erected in the Campus Martius near the tomb of his daughter Julia, and before the rostra was placed a gilded tabernacle on the model of the temple of Venus Genitrix, within which was an ivory bed covered with purple and cloth of gold. At the head was a trophy with the blood-stained robe in which he was slain, it being considered that the whole day would not suffice for carrying the funeral oblations in solemn procession before the corpse, directions were given for every one, without regard to order, to carry them from the city into the campus martius by what way they pleased. To raise pity and indignation for his murder, in the plays acted at the funeral, a passage was sung from Pacuvius's tragedy entitled The Trial for Arms, that ever I, unhappy man, should save wretches who thus have brought me to the grave, and some lines also from Attilius's tragedy of Electra to the same effect. Instead of a funeral panegyric, the consul Antony ordered a herald to proclaim to the people the decree of the Senate, in which they had bestowed upon him all honours, divine and human, with the oath by which they had engaged themselves for the defence of his person, 
and to these he added only a few words of his own. The magistrates and others who had formerly filled the highest offices carried the beer from the rostra into the forum. While some proposed that the body should be burnt in the sanctuary of the temple of Jupiter Capitolinus, and others in Pompey's senate house, on a sudden two men, with swords by their sides and spears in their hands, set fire to the bier with lighted torches. The throng around immediately heaped upon it dry faggots, the tribunals and benches of the adjoining courts, and whatever else came to hand. Then the musicians and players stripped off the dresses they wore on the present occasion, taken from the wardrobe of his triumph at spectacles, rent them, and threw them into the flames. The legionaries also of his veteran bands cast in their armour which they had put on in honour of his funeral. Most of the ladies did the same by their ornaments, with the bully and mantles of their children. In this public mourning there joined a multitude of foreigners, expressing their sorrow according to the fashion of their respective countries, but especially the Jews, who for several nights together frequented the spot where the body was burnt. The populace ran from the funeral with torches in their hands to the houses of Brutus and Cassius, and were repelled with difficulty. Going in quest of Cornelius Cinna, who had in a speech the day before reflected severely upon Caesar, and mistaking for him Helvius Cinna, who happened to fall into their hands, they murdered the latter and carried his head about the city on the point of a spear. They afterwards erected in the forum a column of Numidian marble formed of one stone nearly twenty feet high, and inscribed upon it these words, To the father of his country. At this column they continued for a long time to offer sacrifices, make vows, and decide controversies in which they swore by Caesar. Some of Caesar's friends entertained a suspicion that he neither desired nor cared to live any longer on account of his declining health, and for that reason slighted all the omens of religion and the warnings of his friends. Others are of opinion that thinking himself secure in the late decree of the Senate and their oaths, he dismissed his Spanish guards who attended him with drawn swords. Others again suppose that he chose rather to face at once the dangers which threatened him on all sides than to be for ever on the watch against them. Some tell us that he used to say the Commonwealth was more interested in the safety of his person than himself, for that he had for some time been satiated with power and glory, but that the Commonwealth, if anything should befall him, would have no rest, and, involved in another civil war, would be in a worse state than before. This, however, was generally admitted that his death was in many respects such as he would have chosen. For upon reading the account delivered by Xenophon, how Cyrus in his last illness gave instructions respecting his funeral, Caesar deprecated a lingering death, and wished that his own might be sudden and speedy. And the day before he died, the conversation at supper in the house of Marcus Lepidus, turning upon what was the most eligible way of dying, he gave his opinion in favour of a death that is sudden and unexpected. He died in the fifty-sixth year of his age, and was ranked amongst the gods, not only by a formal decree, but in the belief of the vulgar. For during the first games which Augustus his heir consecrated to his memory, a comet blazed for seven days together, rising always about eleven o'clock, and it was supposed to be the soul of Caesar now received into heaven, for which reason likewise he is represented on his statue with a star on his brow. The senate-house in which he was slain was ordered to be shut up, 
and a decree made that the Ides of March should be called parricidal, and the Senate should never more assemble on that day. Scarcely any of those who were accessory to his murder survived him more than three years, or died a natural death. They were all condemned by the Senate. Some were taken off by one accident, some by another. Part of them perished at sea, others fell in battle, and some slew themselves with the same poniard with which they had stabbed Caesar. End of Julius Caesar Recording by Graham Redman